There we go. Uh, welcome to the Adam Messer Show. This is the second hour. I'm your host, Adam Messer, with my special guest, Teal James Glenn. Welcome back, Teal. How are you? I'm doing good, Adam. Very nice to be here. I'm, I'm really excited. I mean, honestly, I'm really glad. Um, like I said, last hour, uh, we met because of a mutual friend, uh, Carol Geisander, and uh, you and I uh, were introduced over the internet, and then today is the first day we're talking, so... Uh, a lot of fun. I'm in, I'm in the same kind of stuff that you're into, like uh, you know, comic books and stories and that kind of stuff. And so, pretty cool. I'm 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 excited that you're here today. So, thank you very much. Oh, very much my pleasure. Kind of fun to get to check. Um, I did want to explain. Uh, you you talk about swashbuckling. A lot of people may not know what that is. Um, the, I just uh, love saying it because <laughs> I, well, I love calling you a swashbuckler because I'm like. <laughs> I grew up loving pirate stories. Well, my 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 you know my website is the Urban Swashbuckler, mm-hmm. uh, and it's because uh, I got into ultimately stunt work and and film work. I loved the old movie serials, but I was writing a book, and it had a sword fight in it. And a friend of mine who had taken some fencing saw an ad for something called Swashbuckling One Hundred and One. Mm which was a class in stage sword fighting. And I took the class, and the first moment I held the sword in my hand, I knew that's what I wanted to do with the rest oh, of my life. Really? And so Don't you just I love those on, moments? I Oh, it really was like, you know, ah, mm-hmm. and the whole thing. And I went off and I ended up studying, ultimately with Errol Flynn's last um, stunt double, a gentleman named Patty Crean. Um, and, um, and it was a, you know, a one, three week course, but it was, but it was phenomenal. And so that set the course for my life. I, you know, I've done 60 Renaissance festivals since then and every Shakespeare play except King John. Uh, and I've choreographed the fights for, for almost all of them. I think, I don't think I choreographed Coriolanus, but I've done every other Shakespeare and that led to everything else. So, um, that was a watershed and, and, moment for you then, right? Yeah, and, and yeah. swashbuckling actually comes from, in the days of Romeo and Juliet, you would have a small shield called the buckler. Mm-hmm. And if you wanted to challenge someone, you would smack your sword on the shield, and that was called swashing. You'd swash your buckler, which was a challenge to a fight. Oh, so, I did not know so that. Washbucklers were originally punks. <laughs> that reminds me of like, you know, you see on the movies where uh, like the Roman soldiers or the gladiators, they have like, you know, the shield on the left hand and the sword on the other, yeah. and they, they just bash it against there. Yeah, and that was a call to arms. So I, I think it's hilarious that ultimately the term, which comes to mean, you know, pirates and heroes and really comes from the term of you punk. Yeah, so, <laughs> like I'm calling you out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It appeals to my sense of the ironic, because uh, <laughs> language is so much fun. You oh, know? yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it, it's funny, too, because uh, like, uh, Bobby Nash had posted uh, one of those things uh, talking about language, and he's like, what's something that, you know, like a term that people use that, you know, they yes. they, they think, it's like that uh, from the uh, <laughs> the Princess Bride I can't remember his name. What, uh, oh, I don't think that word means what you think it means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's his name, Sebastian? Wesley. No, the, um, the Montoya. What's his name? Indigo Montoya. Yeah, Indigo Montoya. And yeah. uh, <laughs> I think it's so funny because, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've recently discovered that I've been misusing a couple words. And, I, you know, I have a rather decent command of the English language myself. But, you know, it's always interesting to find uh, different nuances well, I mean, that's the other thing, too, is that language changes. So meanings for words that meant one thing once can mean almost exactly the opposite a decade or two decades later. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, or they interchange, uh, you know, like like the reverse of the meaning. Like I've, I've seen sometimes where uh, something satirical will actually become like the new meaning. You know? Yes, well, just even the term bad, you know. Right, right, you right. Bad, you know, bad now means good. That's exactly yeah. like the kind of thing I'm talking about, you know, or like, like yeah. I tell you what, when I was a kid, it was still not popular to be a nerd. Like that was a put down yeah. and an insult. And now it's like nerd culture is, is mainstream. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, you know, it's funny. I used to say that, um, 
people used to constantly put down pro wrestling. Right, right, right. And I love that, wrestling. <laughs> no one would ever admit they watched it, but it was the most popular thing on cable. It's a guilty so pleasure. Like, some, yeah. Yeah, somebody's watching it, boys and girls. Yeah, it's a so, guilty pleasure, yeah. I love yeah, I love old and, school wrestling, I'll tell you. Especially yeah. like back in the day when they did those uh, talk about swashbuckling. Back in the day when they used to do those promos and they <laughs> like <laughs> You know, like Hulk Hogan or Randy Savage. Oh, or, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, they're like, oh, oh yeah. yeah. I actually, I actually got to choreograph a fight for Alpha and Sika, the Wild Samoans. No, you did. No way. That's yeah. cool. And, uh, you know, because they, they, were, they were awesome, but they hadn't fought for, mo- you know, camera fighting is different than live stuff. Right, so, right. You know, um, but, yeah, they were, like, the coolest guys, and they were the size of houses. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've heard like, Samoan people are huge in person. I've never met uh, Samoan person. Oh gosh, yeah, but. yeah. No, I've been. I you know, I still watch pro wrestling because I'll still occasionally pick up a move. Yeah. Like, oh, look at the way they do that. Look how he saves him. He he cradles his head to keep him safe, etc. So, um, yeah. Cause to me, it's all the same. You know, sword fighting, fist fighting, martial arts. They're all connected. It's all movement. And again, like we talked before, it's all storytelling. Yeah, yeah. Because. Pro wrestling now is almost more story than fighting. Yeah, it's it you is. Know, they, it's a lot more know, drama and a lot more you know story. Development. Yeah, yeah. They, you know they have backstories of like evil demons and all this other stuff. It's awesome. Oh. Yeah, and it's it's almost like uh, <laughs> you know they have the wrestling matches, but it's almost like the uh, it's like The Walking Dead almost to me. You know where yeah. it, it, each week the characters are you know like being developed and i don't watch it all that often but i'll catch these little videos you know from time to time like some of my friends yeah, yeah. they'll post a video like a you know whatever and and it is it's almost like a serialized well they actually i mean wwe hires writers to actually write the storyline oh that nice they put their characters in um i mean they you know they have a very realistic view of of where they are in the universe and a lot yeah. of why so many of the the wrestlers have gone on to be actors because they're acting. They're you know it's, they're actually acting. It's, yeah, I think of it as sort of Renfair acting. You know, it's kind of a um, a broad acting style, but it's consistent. You know, and uh, and that to me, you know, again, it's all about storytelling. We all mm-hmm. we want stories. When we see, you know, we see a pile of clothes by the side of the road. We all in our mind make up a story of how they got there. Mm-hmm. You know, we all wonder who, who wore them, where did they come from? And I mean, the only difference between the average person and a writer is a writer will keep that idea and go ahead and create a whole story, mm-hmm. you know, where the average person will think about it for a second and then let it go, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that um, the ability to follow that out uh, is, you know, it's the need to, to find out what the next idea is and to, and to follow it. I know a lot of writers like me who sometimes, I don't know where my story's going to go. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. You know, I'm, a, I'm something what they call a pantser, which is you kind of make it up as you go along. Right. And um, sometimes I'm not quite sure, even if I have a general idea, I'm not quite sure how the heck my hero's going to get out of it until I get him there. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, to me, that's, some of the excitement as I write it to find out what's going to go on, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, talking about uh, WWE, uh, back in 2016, I had the chance to interview Coffee Kingston from the WWE because they were coming oh, cool. to, yeah, they came to town and I wrote an article um, <clears throat> about, you know, them coming to town for SummerSlam or whatever. And I think it was called SummerSlam at the time, but uh, it was so cool because, you know, and I, this is one of the things that I love about the WWE because they are an extremely professional organization. Like one of the top notch that I've ever dealt with when it comes to interviewing a celebrity, which I've, I've interviewed a bunch of different celebrities over the, the last seven years. Um, when we set the interview up, I, you know, sent the information over, they sent the press release. I sent the information over saying, you know, I'd like to request an interview, yada, yada, yada. I was given seven minutes to talk with him on the phone. Uh, They called me from an 800 number and they had a moderator on the call the entire time. 
Now the moderator did not speak other than introducing the call and, you know, finishing the call. But the moderator was with me the whole time and the call was being recorded the whole time. I recorded my end so that I could, you know, do the uh, transcription yeah. or whatever. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, they were extremely professional. Seven minutes, you know, which, you know, if you think about it, you can say a lot of nothing in seven minutes or you can say a lot of something in seven minutes. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I used my time with him, the seven minutes that I had, uh, to – I really wasn't trying to get a sound bite because I couldn't republish the, the, the call, right? But I was trying to yeah. get something, you know, out of him that was, you know, not the run-of-the-mill question. I One of the things I try to do as a journalist and, and even with storytelling, like you're talking about with pantsing um, – I do both. I do pantsing and plotting. I kind of like a pantser sometimes, sometimes more of a pantser. Yeah, same here. Same here. But one of the Are things you? I enjoy as a, uh, as a journalist or as a uh, media person or, or whatever, even storytelling, you know, whatever, is trying to think of something that is not your everyday ham and cheese sandwich type question. You know, yep. I want to think about like, okay, well, what's something that maybe he has never had someone ask him and not, I'm not talking about like something stupid off the wall, like just really ridiculous type thing, you know, absurd. I'm just talking about something like, you know, uh, like we're talking about Conan, you know, yeah, that presented a different opportunity. And I know I, I put you on the spot, but you know, we're going to be having another show talking about Conan because of our conversation today. <laughs> so I, I yeah, look, well, I look at those things and think, okay, well, how can I do something different? Uh, because, you know, like the little factoid things, you know, Teal. Yeah. Those to me, it's like, okay, yeah, we could talk about whatever all day long. But when you start telling me about a cowboy in Carpathia, I'm thinking, you know, like I've seen the blurbs and stuff like that, but I, I didn't, I didn't really make the connection there that it was about a real person. And then you told a little bit about his story and then you told how you put him into this fantasy setting that caught my interest. You know what I mean? That's yeah. the kind of stuff that I'm looking for. It's like, okay, well something different. I don't want to have the same ham and cheese sandwich every day. I don't mind well, having a ham and cheese sandwich, but I'd rather have like a boar's head ham and cheese <laughs> on a freshly baked ciabatta bread you know, uh, versus just your 99 cent bargain bin stuff. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, it's the WWE, you know, it is a megalithic organization. Oh yeah. Who really, they, they came from the idea of, um, marketing. I mean, they, they seriously, I mean, they, mm -hmm. they've developed their own films. Now they have their own, you know, entertainment division. Um, and it's because they understand that that's, you know, sometimes the, um, sometimes the medium is more important than the content. And yeah. you have to, you have to know how to use that medium to, to get the content out there you want. I mean, the, the most successful independent authors are the ones who are really good at marketing what they have. Yeah. And, um, it's it, particularly in a world now where there's so much background noise, it's kind of hard to, to get a little bit above that, that white noise, which is another reason why I appreciate you asking me on the show. Um, aside the fact that it's fun, you know, somebody will hear my name who may not have before. Um, hopefully they won't be a bill collector. And, um, <laughs> Hold and, that thought. Cause we got to do the station ID. <laughs> Speaking about collected bills. We gotta, we gotta pay the bills here. Um, everybody, Thank you for tuning in today. This is the Adam Messer Show, and I'm your host, Adam Messer, with my special guest, Swash Buckler, Teal James Glenn, who is an author, an actor, uh, interesting fellow all the way around, um, on WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. You know, kind of circling back, uh, and I know I was talking about the Steve Range comics last hour uh, with my, my good friends uh, Terry and Darlene Dremel. I enjoyed that series so much and we became friends, not because I enjoy the comic books. I, I met him and his wife because I enjoyed the comic books. We became friends because we, after, you know, we hit it off. Like we just, you know, the first time I met him in person was like when, you know, he came out to the studio. Right. And we just, you know, clicked. We had a lot of stuff in common. 
Um, and it was so much fun. In fact, I have all of the 12 issues of the Steve Range comics, and I'm the only person who has issue number nine, and it was a special one-of-a-kind birthday card that he made just for me. Oh, that's freaking awesome. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Awesome. Like, you know, like, who does that kind of stuff? You know what I mean? Like, for me, it's like, I know it's crazy, but you could not pay me any amount of money for me to sell that to somebody, you know, uh, I, I, it's irreplaceable for me. Um, that's awesome. Well, that's, the, I mean, always the best gifts are the ones that are meant, that are created for you and have thought in them. And that you can't get much more thought than a creative person creating art for you. Yeah. That's, yeah. I, mean, I have a, I have a really nice, uh, my friend Robert spotted pony Lee made me a, um, a Christmas present a couple of years ago and it's, couple of my characters and it's an illustration oh, and wow. same here i wow. would you know you couldn't pry it out of my hands well maybe for a million dollars and i i <laughs> give him a commission but really you know it, yeah, it, yeah yeah that that matters so much that someone thought enough to create for you yeah um so yeah that's awesome that's i awesome. i love that you you said that uh he rendered so uh, illustrations for you about your characters yeah, he, he tell me about he, that. Uh, I, well, I have, I have a, a series uh, character called Doctor Shadows, um, which actually is going to be coming out from Pro Se, uh, and I have one of the books out now from Pro Se, and I have uh, some coming out from Airship Twenty Seven, um, and it's a nineteen thirties adventurer character, hmm. and he did a he did a, a an illustration of that character crossed over uh, in a, you know in a, one of those fantasy settings with with Doc Savage, who was one of my heroes. Um, the original Doc Savage comic, uh, you know, pulp character. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so it was really awesome that he, you know, took the time to do that. Um, and he's, he's somebody I met um, at a pulp convention and did some writing for uh, a magazine of his um, years ago, and um, including some Dr. Shadow stories. What, what is so, his name again? I, I caught part oh, of it. Robert Spotted Pony Lee. Um, okay, cool really cool guy and um but he did a he did a book called blazing adventures um, well shout out to robert that's awesome man yeah um but you know i i've been i've been very blessed by having a lot of creative friends and um uh, in many cases uh i can't fail because i can't let them down mm -hmm. it, it goes beyond me always like i i want to succeed for them yeah um, and that's one of the things that, you know, drives me along sometimes when because, you know, every writer, every artist, every actor reaches a point where they're like, oh, man, I can't. Ta it's too hard. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. um, and then I look at something like that or I look not now, you know, a couple of my reviews for, for Cowboy and Carpathia are like, wow, these people kind of get it. And mm -hmm. I, I want to keep going for them. Um, when I entered art school, the, the head of the school said, if you want to be an artist, you can leave now because it's too hard. But if you need to be an artist, nothing we say will discourage you. So we'll try to help. Mm -hmm. And because it's the arts are very hard because you're, you're putting yourself out there naked in front of people for them to judge things that matter to you a lot. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's really hard. If you have a thousand people saying you're wonderful and one person says, Oh, you suck. That's the only voice you hear. Yeah. And it's really hard to, to reconcile that. And so when I hear that little voice in my head, I remember people like Robert or my friend Jamie or, or Carol who give me, and I'm saying, you know, they can't be wrong because they're really cool people. So mm -hmm. I'm going to listen to them instead of this bozo on the internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I tell uh, you I, that Teal is such a great, uh, a great uh, mindset. I have failed time and time again. I have, I've messed up in my life so many times. It's not even funny. And you know, like the folks that they see the different things that I do successfully, they're like, Oh, you seem like you're always doing this. And I'm like, if you only saw the 99% of the, all the other stuff, <laughs> you you might not think I'm such you know successful or so successful with what I'm doing, and it does. I mean, like I try to filter that kind of stuff out, 
uh, because I don't want to have a big head. I, I appreciate compliments and things like that, but I don't want to have a big head and I don't want to be egotistical. Uh, but yeah, when, when somebody, I'll give an example, a uh, short story that I wrote, uh, published in the, uh, anthology that I put out last year. Um, one person who is a respected reviewer said that it was brilliant. And then another person that I know, um, and I feel like is, you know, respected reviewer said that I was babbling on or rambling on or something like that. And the one that stuck with me was the rambling on part. Cause I was thinking to myself, well, how is it that one person thinks I'm brilliant and the other person thinks I'm just rambling on, you know? So like you said, that one, you know, you could have a thousand great reviews and then you have one that's kind of maybe not even necessarily negative, but might be a little petty or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it just kind and, of sticks with you. Is, is that that's the other thing too, is that ultimately everyone has a different opinion. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, so on one hand you have to write to please yourself because if you don't, Please, your, if you if you can't say I'm proud of this, mm -hmm. then you, you have no right to put it out there. Um, I write stories that I want to read. That's exactly, what I write. I was going to say, yeah. If if you create it and put it out there, and you can say honestly, um, I'm I'm, okay, I'm I'm proud of this. I this is something I would like. And then someone says they don't like it, then it's you know okay. They have an opinion. I have an opinion. I'm I'm here. I win. Well, that's why restaurants have multiple combos. They don't just have one, <laughs> you know. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's I, the thing. I, I, that that's, <laughs> that's taste and that's, per, you know, preference and things like that. I mean, again, going back to the ham and cheese sandwich, I, you know, I think about that because it's such an easy reference. But, you know, ham and cheese, you can make a ham and cheese sandwich a million different ways, you know, and you can make a good one or you can make a bad one. Um but if you enjoy it, like, let's just say you like that 99 cents bargain uh, ham. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, there's, yep. this, there's this canned ham that's this, I can't remember the name of it, but it's this, uh, actually, Bill Cooper just came in the studio. Bill, what's that, what's that canned ham called that they, they make at the store, the canned ham? Well, it's like used, spam, but it's not spam, it's, can, it's ham. Yeah, I know. It used to be uh, a <clears throat> made one. And it's a Danish one. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. You know what I'm talking about? There used to be, in every store, it was three pound. Three pound canned hams uh -huh. all the time. Yeah, now you can get them like a one pound. Right, but I mean they used to be everywhere, but now I don't even see the three pounders anymore. The yeah. canned ham isn't as popular as the ham that's fresh. You know, so yeah. I really don't know the one you're talking about, but yeah, if you're right. If you like it, then what do you care what anyone else says? Yeah, well that's that's yep. what, that's kind of the point I'm getting at. Is like you know, I grew up. Sometimes my grandma, my great grandparents would. You know, spam was one of those things that came around. I I think in World War Two, spam. Yeah, that was something they invented for uh, the soldiers, right? Yeah, I, I believe you're right that it was first. Yeah, well, spam. My grandma used to make these fried spam sandwiches for me as a kid, and she'd make hand, you know, handmade. She'd take and make handmade potato French fries that she would put in a uh, a little pot, you know, a little, uh, just a regular little pot. She would fry them up in that for me, and I I liked it. You know, it's one of those guilty pleasures, kind of like a uh, teal where you're saying like. <laughs> about the wrestling, you know, somebody's watching it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I, I don't Why actually is it believe in admit guilty it? pleasure. <laughs> I, I, I'm one of those people who thinks if you like it, then that's okay. Yeah. No guilt involved, you yeah. know? Well, that's what, uh, that's, I, that's what I, kind of going back to the stories, you know, the books and stuff like that. You know, I know there's some people that, uh, because I, I've been publishing horror and writing horror, they're like, they're just telling me, I, it's just not my thing. I don't like horror. And I'm like, I, I respect that. You know, I respect that because if you if it's not your thing, then I'm not going to I don't want you trying to read my story if that is not your thing. You know, if you if you just some people, they have an aversion to horror stories. That's fine. You know, but there's other well, people. It's out there interesting. Do. One of the one of the reasons I mean, I, I I'm in the Horror Writers Association. Me, too. I'm uh, an active member as well. And, and um, but horror is such a field that, you know, it's not just splatter. It's right. not just, you know, Bela Lugosi is considered horror. Buffy right. the Vampire is considered horror. You couldn't get further apart, but they both have vampires. Well, know? one of the things I love about horror is it covers every genre. Yep. You know, and if it's you, when you're talking about earlier about, you know, the, the classics going back to Homer, 
and you know the other you know storytelling like you could literally consider mythology as horror stories based off of oh yeah persephone you know and and lord of the dead and all of that yeah it's, it's how you you know it's how you tell the story and yeah. as much as what's in the story like i don't um, like uh I'll, I'll be honest with you there's there's aspects of horror that i don't like reading and i don't publish you know it's just it's just one of those things you know but it's a preference i mean we have preferences of stuff that we like like honestly there's friends that i have that they've never read a comic book in their life which i'm like what how do you you know have but they they never have read a comic and so i read from comic books so i'll never say to a kid oh read a real book no that's a real book yeah you know well one of the things i do love too uh teal is like i have some friends who are librarians and graphic novels have become a really good tool for kids yes and you know i love that um but I have I've had friends, you know, uh, games like we're talking about video games earlier. You know, games they're the ones that I enjoy the most are the ones that are centered around storytelling. You know, and that you go and you do these different things. You know, uh, you might do a quest on whatever, but you're following a story arc when you're doing it. You know, and I, I feel like this is the same thing with a good book. You know, you're like you want to read that next, you know, Doc Savage book or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And the thing is, is that. Um, I, you know, a lot of people got onto things like Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm like, you know what? It got kids reading. Yeah. I'm t- anything that gets kids reading and engaged is a win. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. If they're just reading National Geographic or if they're just reading, uh, popular mechanics, they're still reading. Or even and Pokemon if, you know, cards. Yeah, Pokemon yeah, cards that I, have the, all the story. Like I tell you what, I learned a lot about statistics as a kid, just reading about baseball card stats, reading yep. the paper daily to see who won what. You know, reading, dude, like that all was like you know consuming reading in one little package. Yep. You know, but it gave me a lot of analytical skills and things like that. I can't believe we've got to do the station break already. It's been it's it's been a half an hour already, Teal. The second it's been an hour and a half already. Can you believe that? Well, I was vaccinated with a phonograph needle, so keep going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's Sebastian Messer playing in the studio, and we're gonna do um, our station announcements. You are listening to the Adam Messer Show today with my special guest Teal James Glenn Swashbuckler Extraordinaire, and here's Sebastian Messer playing live, and his band is called Krieger. <laughs> great bass thank you how you been doing with that band it, it coming right. along yeah you're gonna be playing live here in the studio may the 2nd we're gonna have like a little uh concert here i think that's gonna be a lot of fun so yeah uh teal sebastian started playing uh at 13 and he's gonna be 19 this year and uh so he plays acoustic but uh his band is a what is it like a thrash metal heavy metal I, I just say metal. Metal. Yeah. Yeah. So. Cool. Well, yeah, Dad, nobody wants to be labeled. Don't right, be right. <laughs> right. Yeah, nobody. He said nobody wants to be labeled. It's it so true. Like, metal is just a genre, but you could be whatever you want to be. Like, he plays acoustic, and then he plays blues, and he's just a musician. Overall, like, he's a good musician. But, but uh, yeah, you know, talking about storytelling and that kind of stuff, uh, Teal, um, Oh, before I forget, before I forget. So, uh, when you see Ellen Datlow, do the same thing for me and say, Adam from Savannah said hello. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to have to like send you some money for all these errands. I'm like, can you, <laughs> can you, hey, I'll never turn down money. You know? I know, right. 
<laughs> we're like, hey. Uh, but no, you know, I think that's one of the cool things about, um, like, because I'm an active member of the HWA as well. I joined in 2019. And I think it's one of the cool things about it is, um, and not just necessarily like the HWA, but when you find your people, uh, yep. It doesn't have to necessarily be an official organization or whatever. You don't have to be like a dues paying member, yada, yada, yada. But when you find your people and they're into the same kind of, you know, stuff. Like, for example, if I were a swashbuckler and I were like, hey, man, I'm a swashbuckler, too. And you'd be like, really? Like how? And then we would, you know, have some commonality there. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's true. I mean, uh, uh, you know, there's only so many people who do sword in the country. There's so many, you know, so many martial artists. When you you meet somebody, they you know they have a common background mm-hmm. and common interests, and um, it it's part validation for yourself, but it's also you know you're going to grow because you're going to learn new things from them about the thing you love. Well, we have like and, a, here in Savannah. You know, I've got a friend named Joe, and we have a group. That, they've got a group that they dress out in full medieval battle armor and they do like the full contact uh, oh, so, uh the sca yeah yeah and uh, i don't know a ton about it. i've seen him demonstrate a couple times but uh this guy joe that i know like he is all about it. i mean he loves it and they haven't been able to do it this last year obviously because of covid um yeah but he was talking about, you know, like with folks getting vaccinated and yada, yada, yada. And like they're looking at trying to get something together for June. And I was like, oh, that's cool, you know. Um, but, yeah, it's like when you when you find your, your people and you're like, yeah, man. I mean, you could talk for hours geeking out about it, you know. Yeah, no, it's true. I and mean, I've over the years, I've had tons of friends in the SCA because like I said I did 60 Renaissance fairs. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of them were professional, but then it was also, there'd be a lot of the SCA guys there. And I, you know, I've, I've appeared at SCA events. I do story, medieval storytelling, right? I do all the voices and stuff as well. Um, but you know, it goes with the acting stuff. Right, right. And, um, <clears throat> and so I have a lot of friends in all the organizations and the, the, the truth be told, if I had not probably found the, the means to, um, make something of a living with the sword, I would have still ended up in the SCA or something like it because the culture drew me, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 the chivalry of it, the, 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 the respect for history, all of that is very appealing to me. Well, and, even the folks, there's, there's folks that, there's, there's folks yeah. that don't, they don't uh, do that. Like there's all like, I, I don't know a ton about it, but there's a lot of different aspects. There's folks that uh, I've seen out there that they do like the medieval cooking, and like they're not they out do, there, you know, bashing yeah. each other with a sword or whatever. They're well. They also they have they have laurel leaf competitions for poetry, for embroidery, right. for um, for songwriting and bardic, right. bardic activities. Right. Um, it's a very complete organization, and it was actually founded by a bunch of fantasy and science fiction writers in California. Right. Um, I didn't know that, but that's Paul cool. Anderson and a bunch of those writers from the the sixties. They said, you know, they like to dress up, and it basically it was LARPing before LARPing, you know, live action role playing right. before it had an official name, and then they started to form an. All right, all right. Uh, we just uh, lost Teal, but let me call him right back. Hello, what happened? Uh, I'm not sure. I think we lost connection there, Teal. I'm sorry. Uh, we're live on the air on WRU uh, 107.5 FM, so I just want to okay. give you. But yeah, sorry about uh, getting disconnected. I don't know what happened. That's all right. But uh, you were saying that uh, the last part I heard was the about the Paul Anderson and they started the. Oh, Paul Anderson, a bunch of uh, fantasy writers founded the SCA, and because they basically wanted to dress up in the costumes and they they wanted to practice. You know, uh, you know, try out some of the scenes from their stories, and eventually, it became this organization that you know every year they have gatherings of ten, fifteen thousand people mm-hmm. camping. In uh, I've actually been to the Penzik War, which is a a giant event in in uh, Pennsylvania, um, where for weeks people live in tents and walk around and sort of live the life. Mm-hmm. Um, it's astounding and. You know that makes it into my fantasy books because I've got I've got a series of fantasy books that are going to be going to be coming out, some of which were published before but all new, uh, and 
you know, it's kind of cool that I've been lucky enough to like, I know what it's like to just, Mm -hmm. I know what it's to, to wear leather armor or chain all day long. So I can put that into my story. So like I said before, sometimes I'm not sure if I became a writer to justify this stuff or because I was doing all this stuff, I had to find, <laughs> I had to, find yeah. to not be declared insane. Like, no, I'm a writer. It's okay. Um, I'm, I'm yeah. only Googling how you can uh, do this and that and the other because uh, I'm, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm looking up an FBI agent. That's all. <laughs> That's, yeah. you know, I'm a writer. All my friends say, you know, if I die suddenly, destroy my browser history. Please. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's funny though, because like uh, when you're talking earlier about uh, with writing, it is weird because w- not weird in a weird way, but weird in like a kind of like just different way. There are times where I'll have uh, an idea or whatever, and I'll I'll message myself or. You know, uh, like if I'm in the middle of writing a scene, for example, but something uh, like an offshoot will hit me. I've got another page for like notes and stuff that I'll be like, oh, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. and yeah. it might work out. It might not. You know, I might use it. I might not, you know, um, but I always think it's funny. Uh, pantsing. So, for example, the, the novel I'm writing right now, I just hit 40K yesterday and I I did the first act I wrote out a uh, a synopsis outline and I got halfway through the second act with a synopsis outline. And then I was like, "Ah, man, I don't want to spend, I don't want to spend, you know, six months writing the outline before I start writing. So I just started jumping in writing using the synopsis for the story. Well, I'm 40 K in and I'm on the back half of act two, getting ready to jump into act three. And I don't feel like I want to write the rest of the outline or the synopsis because I'm kind of going through the discovery part of it as well as I'm writing. I'm like, okay, well, you know, uh, I, I am enjoying, you know, I had kind of like a, a, an idea of where I wanted to go, but I know some writers who they have basically when they write their outline, they're pretty much writing the skeleton of the entire story. And then they go back from their outline and they flesh out the details. Um, yeah. You yeah. Know, and I, it, I think it's all about like what you're comfortable with, you know? Exactly. I mean, it, it's sometimes the characters take over and you have to go somewhere. I have a, I had a story where one character was supposed to basically be a one night stand for the hero. Hmm. Um, and by the end of the chapter that that character was in, she became a, co-character for the entire novel and I had to completely rethink where the rest of the book went because um, she just became real enough that I had to tell her story Yeah, and yeah. you know and to me that's kind of the highest level of it because you're almost tapping into um, it's almost like automatic writing or spirit writing in the sense that you're tapping into something that you're not even conscious of, mm-hmm. and yet there it is. It, it's telling you, no, no, I'm not going away. I matter. And and when they become real to you, they'll become real to your reader. I've got a character and, in this one you know, just like that. Like this this sidebar guide type character has become a full fledged like main character. And yeah, I'm like, why? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm just going with. It. I'm like, okay. All right, buddy, you're well, here. I have a, I have a, a novel, uh, Dragon Throat, and when I first wrote it, um, when I when I finished it, I realized I kind of set myself a goal. There's a lot of characters in it, and I decided I wanted to try and write a story with each one of the characters. And I've written stories with about maybe half to three quarters of the characters who sometimes only have like two scenes in the book. But I'm like, this character, I want to know more about him. So I've, I've written stories with those characters, even though, uh, you know, they, they had no more relevance to the world or what have you. So right, it, it, right. You know, but... It's like become, it's like writing a story about the barista that you picked a coffee up from. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, they they yeah. sort of like, you know... They, they, they happen they start, and they were part of the scene, but... Yeah, yeah. It, but when they, when they become important to you... They become important to the reader, right, to the client, right, as right. it was. And right. um, 
I think it's a, that's I think that's amazing with the discovery part of of writing, um, you know, the draft. I don't know how to say this, but uh, I started fiction writing when I was a kid, but I didn't start wanting to publish fiction until like 2013, 2014 or whatever. Actually, not even that. It was 20, 2007. I had, no, 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 2006. I had a, an English professor that was like, hey, you know, you're a really good writer for your term papers. Have you ever thought about fiction writing? So uh, I did a little bit of stuff then, but I didn't publish anything. Of course, you know, self-publishing and all that, whatever. But I didn't really want to, I didn't really start getting serious about this until probably 2013, 2014. And I didn't publish anything and blah, blah, blah. And I think one of the biggest things that I've learned, um, Teal, and I'm still like new and I'm not, you know, I'm not a best selling author or anything like that. But one of the things I've learned is consistency, just being consistent, you know, even if it's like, Hey, I've got this story, uh, you know, and I've, I've got this offshoot and yada, 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 just being consistent, you know, and doing the work. I feel like has for me, it's been, so much more uh, fulfilling, I guess, by just doing the work and, and, and getting that story done. Yep. I mean, it, it, uh, even if you write five words a day, mm-hmm. you realize writing five words a day, you have a novella by the end of a year. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just doing... I'm actually a very slow writer, but I write every day. Nice. And... On, on some days, I'm able to write more than others. Uh, and, you know, because some days you're doing the research, so you're not you're not actively writing, but you're sort of It's part of the writing, writing process, writing. though. Yeah. Yeah. And But every day I try to do something because um, uh, it was Ray Bradbury said that if you wrote a story every week, at mm-hmm. the end of the week, it's impossible to have 52 bad stories in a row. You know, <laughs> I, st- I love that because... I came across Ray Bradbury I, as, oh my gosh, we got to do the station ID. I got to tell you the story though. Um, everybody, you're tuning in today to the Adam Messer Show. I'm your host, Adam Messer, talking with my special guest, swashbuckler, author, actor, extraordinaire, Teal James Glenn. I keep, every time I just keep making it, you know, uh, by the end of this, you're going to be like the game master and all this other <laughs> stuff, <laughs> the guild master and all. Um, here on WRUU, LP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRU.org. We are Savannah Signings Community Radio Global Soul. Okay, so here's my Ray Bradbury story. I did not start reading Ray Bradbury until last year because as a high schooler, we had to read Fahrenheit 451 as a compulsory read. It's part of English, ninth grade yep. English or whatever, yada, yada, yada. I always liked Asimov, and I, I read a lot of like fantasy stuff. Um, and sci-fi stuff as a kid. I did not read Ray Bradbury. Um, a friend of mine posted uh, one of those, you know, those old black and white films, A Day in the Life of? Yeah. Okay, so they had one of Ray Bradbury. And so I was like, okay, let me check it out, blah, blah, blah. blah. And it's, you know, I, I kind of like it. I like watching those old black and white films sometimes because it kind of gives you an idea of, like, what was going on. And, uh, and he had a... He had a um, <laughs> Across from his typewriter in his basement was a sign that said, don't overthink. And I was like, oh, so that was the the human connection I had with him. That moment. I was like, oh, okay. He had the same problem that I have. Then I started, I watched um, a talk that he did because he used to lecture at a college. And one of the things that he said was that he, he, spent 10 years in the libraries earning his education he would go to the library back then you know cost like 10 cents or something like that uh it was very expensive to be able to type on a typewriter back in the day it's not like today where people can do whatever they want on the phones and yada 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 but he's he was talking about when you're writing you know he was a pantser uh when, when you're writing if you're if you have like writer's block it's because it's something that's not you know, lining up with your heart. Right. And he, I did, I did the Ray Bradbury challenge. I started to, I only, I got about 75 days in, but he said, if you want to be a better writer, read one poem, one short story and one, 
Oh gosh. Uh, article? Not article. Not article. Uh, but one essay. I'm sorry. It was an essay. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. One poem, one short story, and one essay. A night for a thousand nights. And talking about the writing, you know, I love that he said, you know, write a short story every week. You know, by the end of it, you're going to have 52 short stories. And like you said, they can't all be bad. Yep. You know, yep. and if you, you know, if you're reading and you're doing these other things. And so I did that like for 75 days in a row. I did that. And I don't know why I stopped doing it. I think it was life happened with uh, the COVID stuff or whatever. I just kind of, I got derailed. But I saw, I've i read a bunch of Ray Bradbury. They've, they've got these volumes of these short stories of Ray Bradbury's, right? And I, I've i read probably 60 or 70 sh- uh, short stories by Ray Bradbury since last year. And that has had a fundamental change you know, we were talking about watershed moment. That has had a yep. fundamental change on me with writing fiction, and I, it has nothing to do with my style of writing because I don't emulate anybody. I don't emulate Ray Bradbury. I don't emulate Tolkien. I don't emulate Asimov. Nobody. But it's had a fundamental change on the way I look at my writing as an author. I'm not a best-selling author, and like I said, I mess up. I I fail teal every day. I mess up every day. A lot of times I feel like a flunky, (laughs) but I still move and get up up and do the work. Yeah, yeah. Fall down nine times, get up ten. Right. That's That's my motto. Yeah. And then, like I said earlier, people are like, oh, you do this, you do that. I'm like, man, if you only saw the pit of gravel that I just crawled out of on hands and knees and, you know, broken glass. (laughs) Yeah. You know, that's one of the things like uh, when I see somebody who's hustling and they're doing their thing, even if it's not my stick, even if it's not my ham and cheese sandwich that I want to eat. I have a lot of respect for what they're doing because they did it. Yep. And they put it out there. That's it. It's, it's, um, it's a piece of somebody's heart. Mm -hmm. No matter how bad it might seem to the external, it has some of them in it, which is why I never, I, I never criticize somebody darkly. Me either. I opinion. I try to say, how can I help this be more this? I teach, I teach young kids and it's always about not um criticizing but critiquing the right. difference be- how can it be better not how is it bad right there's a big right. difference right you know again that goes back to me wanting to give hope even in my horror stories i i want there to be light um because there's too much darkness in the world so if i can give a little light somewhere even in that so much the better um that's amazing a, yeah in martial arts there's a thing where um, you know somebody may be doing uh, a technique and they do it and they fall on their butt and if there's giggling in the room it's not they're laughing at the person falling they're remembering when when they, they fell. fell yeah yeah and that, and that is the attitude to always have is that remember you know you're you're also not human before your coffee uh, yeah. You know. Oh yeah. Well, that's that's something too, man. Like I, you know, I know like the old saying that you're your own worst critic. I mean, that's that's the truth, you know. And that's that's one of the things. Like uh, you know, often when I I have those negative thoughts or those you know those like oh man this is just utter garbage type thing, I have to remember like oh I wouldn't say that. Like if I saw something that you did and I thought it was utter garbage, I would never tell you that. I would never say something negative to you like that ever. You know, I would, yeah. I would not do that. And and then I think to myself, well, why would I do that to myself? You know, and, yeah. you know, we have that. Yeah. We have, we all have that, that, uh, that I, the, I call it like the little goblin brain. It's yeah, like, Oh, you know, it's yeah. garbage. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, shut up. <laughs> shut up. Yeah. I, did you write it? No, you didn't write it. <laughs> yep, exactly. And the thing is, is that, that, um, when I when I taught self defense, I remember a woman once, you know, I was showing a technique and she said, oh, I, I could never do that. And I would say, Would you do that if your child was in danger? And and they would say, Yes. They said, Well, how are you less valuable than your child? All right, all right. And why would your child not want you to be around? So learn the technique and hopefully you never use it. And you yeah. know, the thing is that, you know, if never give a critique, you would not want to have yourself. 
And I think and, when Shakespeare was talking about the groundlings, you said you yeah. did a lot of Shakespeare. When I remember, because yep. I took AP English in high school, and we read, we studied Shakespeare for a year. And I remember when he was talking about the groundlings, like he was talking to the audience, and they didn't even know that he was talking to the audience, right? Yep. And yep. but he's talking to them like, you can't do what we're doing, and yet you criticize us, you know. Yeah. And yeah. I just always thought it was so funny because, uh, like, the, the folks who who have the negative, like, the internet trolls or whatever, it's nothing new. I mean, they, they were trolls back in Shakespeare's day. Oh, yeah. I, they, we just we just can be more immediate about it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's the sad thing is that uh, – and now it's, it, it can be out there. A thousand people in ten minutes can put you down. And it seems like the negative stuff like that gets – you know, like you could have a, like you said, you could have a thousand great reviews or wonderful, you know, whatever. And that one yeah. that's like the little troll. <laughs> yeah. That's the one that and, sticks and, out. It's like, oh. Again, that's the one, that's the one that sounds loudest to us. Yeah. You know? And that's, it also, it's kind of crazy. But for some reason, that seems like always the one too that people are like, oh yeah, I thought it was garbage too. It's like, yeah. what? Yeah. Where's this bandwagon coming from? <laughs> You know, yep. like, yep. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I just thought it was funny. Cause, but with storytelling, and I know we've got to wrap this up. We got two minutes left. But with storytelling, you know, I think it's great. I, I especially love the the idea that you uh, that you approach with your storytelling. Uh, you know, that you want to you want to give hope. I mean, like it is. There's a lot of dark, evil stuff out there in this world, and it's really nice to see somebody who's like, hey, you know what? Let's do something. You know, upbeat and positive and. You know, it's got it can have like action and adventure and you know fantasy and magic and all this other stuff and you know and I think that's really cool, Teal, and I really appreciate you being on the show the last two hours. Well, I, I appreciate you having me. This has been a lot of fun. It's really nice to connect with you and your your readers and hear your son play. Very cool. Oh, uh, one last thing: where is the best place that folks can check out your books and especially the the one that you just won an award, uh, Cowboy and Carpathia. Uh, Cowboy and Carpathia, and actually my, my new thriller, John John Shadows and Killing Shadows, came out the same day I won the award. Oh, congratulations. Amazon, I'm, uh, uh, there's Teal James Glenn, on, uh, there are pages of me with my stuff on Amazon, I uh, just sold a new story to Mystery Weekly, so I'm out there. That's awesome. I'm, for- <laughs> I'm going to have a link also on the podcast. So, uh, folks, if you're just now tuning in and you missed the uh, the show, uh, you can listen to the whole thing on the Adam Messer Show dot com later on, or YouTube dot com slash Adam Messer. Excuse me, and I will have a link to Teal's works there directly, so you can click on it and go um, check it out. Uh, so, thanks again, Teal. I really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun today with you. Thank, thank you very much, Adam. You all take care. You too.